Today at ShopDap.com, we talk about buying the cheapest Mark 7 in the whole wide world. Whenever anybody's shopping for a used car, they always want to get the best deal possible, but what really is the best deal? This is a 2015 VW GTI. It has 130,000 miles on it, and I paid 9,200 for it. Right now, the used car market is crazy. If we look at same year GTIs around the country on Auto Trader, we find a price of similar cars at dealers to range from around 12,500 to around $16,000. This is going to vary by market, equipment, and mileage of the vehicle. Before we talk about why our car costs so much less than all of these, it's important to understand that all of the cars shown there are from a dealer. Your expectations when you buy a car from a dealer is that the car is going to be problem free, but this car was sold to me as not problem free, which we're about to show you. Also, I just wanted to say, Nick, the guy who I bought this car from, was a really good guy, and he was completely upfront about everything that was going on with this car, so we didn't really have a lot of surprises along the way. Starting from the outside of the vehicle, anybody who's familiar with a Mark 7 GTI is gonna know that those wheels are not factory, and well, let's be honest, they look terrible. The good news is that I hoard wheels, a lot of wheels. I never get rid of them, except for very special occasions like family. There's always room for family. Moving on to the front bumper, you can see that the paint is peeling worse than a guy who passed out two days ago after half a dozen Four Locos. When looking at the rear bumper, you can see there's damage over here, 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 and here. And our final blemish is gonna be this crack right here on the sunroof trim here. This actually could potentially cause a water leak. There's one on this side that's gone all the way through this trim and there's a small fracture on the opposite side. Now in our case, we do not have a water leak so we don't need to worry, but it is something to be aware of when you have that issue. And because we're shooting outside, we have to deal with mother nature, which is birds chirping. Get out of here. As you can hear, that's the sound of something going on. Okay, so the noise you just heard was from a downpipe. So this has a, that's a new noise. I've seen very inexpensive aftermarket downpipes and what they always do is they hit the section on the subframe where the there's two little hangers that are supposed to mount the downpipe. They don't actually fit in there and so it just bangs against the subframe the whole time. This car drives pretty good. There's not really a lot of drivability concerns. That noise is really the only major concern. From now, this car has aftermarket springs on it. Likely, if you have a car that has upgraded suspension that's harsher, and you have a lot of miles like this one, 130,000, the likelihood that, that that has additional wear to the bushings on the car is pretty high. So I expect that's actually what's gonna be the problem. Another important thing you're gonna look for whenever you have a car like this that you're buying, especially any Mark 7, is gonna be uh, wheel bearings or something that could make noise. So tire noise is gonna be a common problem. The other common problem is gonna be wheel bearing noise. Easy way to do that, pitch the car left and right. You'll determine if the noise changes its pitch. Uh, somebody behind you, you think you're, dr you're a drunk driver, but you will be determining which side of a noise from a wheel bearing would be coming from. Supposedly this car has a stock tune on it currently because it had a Cobb uh, access port with an E85 tune and all that stuff. That's been removed. It feels quicker than stock to me, but it also has an upgraded high pressure fuel pump. So I don't know if that's actually part of the reason why it feels quicker than a stock car. This car, I can tell you because I've stopped from very high speeds, uh, vibrates a little bit. So the front brakes have some probably either wear or pad distribution issues. So that's the vibration we're dealing with there. Minor, nothing to be super concerned about. The other thing you're looking for is just general noises while you're test driving. So once you get past all that, your test drive is complete and we can do, and that noise is gonna make every time apparently we let off the clutch, 130,000 miles. The car's previously been modified, but it's on the stock clutch. Now, this clutch releases still fairly low to the floor, which means 
there shouldn't be a lot of wear. Now, he didn't mention that the clutch had slipped previously. He mentioned he had never had a problem with it slipping. So there's some a testament to, as I've said in the past, some cars, when they're modified, they'll slip, uh, and it probably has a lot to do with how you drive your car. One thing you wanna make sure you do on any used car before you purchase it is scan for faults. Now this car has a check engine light, a TPMS light, and a bulb warning error. To scan for faults, we're gonna use this OBD11, plug it in under our dash, and then you have your faults on your iPhone. Does that say 50 faults? 50 faults. 50, <laughs> it's pretty good. Now speaking of OBD11, you might be thinking, where can you purchase it? Which gives us a perfect opportunity to plug our site. Are you looking for maintenance, repair, or performance parts for your Volkswagen or Audi? Then head over to shopdap.com, where we have any part you can buy from your local VW and Audi dealer, and a variety of performance brands like Unitronic, APR, Integrated Engineering, and more. If you find this video helpful, please consider supporting us with your purchases, and then you might get enough parts to fix those 50 fault codes like we got. First, there are 12 ECM faults. So when we look at them, we have data bus error. That's no big deal. It's probably just a dead battery. Fuel pump module control circuit low. Could be an issue with the fuel pump. Catalyst efficiency below threshold. We know that's because of the cheapo aftermarket downpipe that's on here, which is also rubbing, which we know is a problem. Misfire cylinder one intermittent. Catalyst, that's another one downpipe related. Misfire, misfire. Fuel pump short circuit could be, again, issue with the fuel pump module. Uh, we have a camshaft advanced fault, another camshaft fault, turbo bypass valve fault, oxygen sensor fault. That's probably also related to the downpipe. I'm not gonna be super concerned about any of these because they are intermittent faults. I am going to clear them and then see what does come back in this circumstance. The only ones I expect I know will come back because there's no drivability issues with this car or anything like that is going to be the cat faults and the ones related to the cat stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear those. Also something to keep in mind, clearing faults uh, in, in a scan tool like this doesn't actually fix anything on your car. So if you still have stuff wrong with your car, expect those faults to come back. Go to our brake system. We have a tire pressure warning fault. Uh, he mentioned that there was some coating stuff he had done, which is that, the reason why the TPMS light's on. We also have a steering angle sensor too low. That's just from probably at some point a dead battery. We have an air conditioning compressor fault for short circuit to ground, and we'll address it if it comes back. In the central electrics module, we have nine faults. That's right, faults nine times. Nine times. Nine times. If you ever want to find a Volkswagen meet, just look for the orange glow in the sky. <laughs> Low beam faults. This has aftermarket headlights and aftermarket xenon, so that's going to be related to that. Key battery voltage too low. Key battery two voltage too low, so both keys have dead batteries. We have license plate lamp fault, which is probably because this car has LEDs would be my guess, or we have an, a license plate bulb out. None of them are a big deal. We're going to clear them. We'll see if they come back. Fun fact, if you are gonna go through your system and clear faults like this, you should actually know what the faults are and you shouldn't just be willy-nilly clearing faults because if you do that and you take it to get fixed by somebody, they may have incomplete information because of faults you've erased. So if nothing else, save them. The gateway has 23 faults. Now gateway is basically the control module that allows all the other control modules to communicate. Uh, we have TPMS lost communication undefined control module, which is probably related to the TPMS as well. Another undefined control module. Wow, there's a lot of things that say undefined control module. Um, so there is some weird stuff going on, I think, probably because of a bunch of coding related stuff. There's a lot of things that say undefined control modules. I've never seen these faults before. So again, I'm gonna erase them, but be aware. So I tried to clear these 23 faults and these 23 faults are not going away at all, which means our friend Nick has been messing with stuff he shouldn't be messing with. <laughs> so I'm gonna have my work cut out for me to figure out what's up with that. Uh, we, in multimedia, we have a fault for tuner satellite radio. Literally every Volkswagen or Audi on the planet has this fault, everyone. I don't even know why the fault exists because they're just all, they're all there. Important fact that I think we may not have mentioned before this right here on your OBD11 is an apps. So if you don't know what these apps do, don't just continue to change things. It's a bad idea. 
Now we're going to look over this car and inspect for any damage that there may be existing either in the suspension, engine, or other things. Hopefully we'll locate our rear suspension noise. We're going to start by inspecting underneath the hood. We can see most notably there's no engine cover, which who cares about that? Other things that are going on with this, I know he has uh, fresh coils, fresh plugs. We're looking for oil leaks, coolant leaks, things like that. Most common problem on this engine is the water pump thermostat assemb assembly that's right under here. We have a DIY video. Uh, I can't really see from here whether it's leaking, so we're really gonna be focusing on that from the bottom. Aside from that, the main thing I'm looking for on the engine compartment is gonna be probably oil leaks. I am gonna look kind of in the areas where I know things have been previously modified. This car at one point had an intake. It had a flex fuel sensor, which was located right here. This has an upgraded high pressure fuel pump that's still in it. And then you can see that there's a braille battery. This is a, a lightweight battery. These are generally pretty expensive. And other than that, there's not a lot here that I think is looks out of place or anything going on. So not really much of note under here other than it's maybe a little bit dirty and it could be cleaned, but looks okay. Back here in the back of the engine that does have a DV plus on it, diverter valve upgrade for, uh, for a lot of these cars. One important note about Mark 7s, the reliability has always been in question on these and I, I probably answered 2,700 questions over the years about how reliable they are. Most of them when the car was too new, so I probably mostly just said, I don't really know yet because there's not enough mileage on most of them to know for sure. These cars have turned out to be extremely reliable. The only major concerns that they have are gonna be things like thermostat housing. Uh, some of these cars that have sunroofs have some water leaks, That's, that is a concern. Other than that, there's really not a lot of common problems on this car and definitely nothing super scary that you have to worry about, like on the predecessor, the Mark VI GTI. Okay, so first impressions, it has an oil leak. So our oil leak appears to be coming from the oil pan or this level sensor right here. So because of that, it's not really too scary. It's probably either from this sensor here or from this, this here. So either way, it's not a big deal. It's a nothing problem. This car also came with an intercooler. This has the, the forged front mount intercooler, a twin cooler that keeps the factory mount one and then adds one in the front which is great news because I don't want to do another intercooler. Le Mans Touring AS. So if you want to tour on the Le Mans, this is more like the Lemons series, not the Le Mans. So if we look here, you can see these tires are kind of dry rotted. That is the sign that these tires should be replaced. Now, if you look, we've located the noise and it is precisely what old Papa Paul said that this downpipe this bad boy right here is a banging away on here like a metal woodpecker. If you see, hitting right here. And so that's the banging away. So honestly, uh, you could just take this, unbolt it, and then just like shear off the end of this thing, like cut it off and it would stop that from banging. And if you don't know, I like to use my cutoff wheel whenever I get the opportunity. When we're looking over the rest of the car, it does appear as all everything's in good shape. CV boots, ball joint, the tie rod over here, all this stuff appears to be in pretty good order. This is the uh, sway bar link right here. Nothing appears to have too much play or anything. And that is both on the driver's side and you're gonna also inspect the passenger side as well. We're looking at the brakes. Brakes appear to be okay. There's no lip on these rotors or anything like that. Don't touch brakes unless, if, unless you uh, have, I don't know how to talk apparently. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch brakes if you've recently driven the car because they will be hot. Uh, that's one important note. Other than that and the fact that they vibrate, they look okay. All right, so we have a pry bar. I'm gonna be using this just to pry on some of these different bushings. It will determine whether we have play or not. So it helps. It's good on especially higher mileage applications. You can kind of just pry around on things and you wiggle the bushings based on the way they move if you have excessive play. Give it a wiggle, you can see it's gonna move in that way, which is kind of normal. You're gonna expect some play laterally, but you wanna make sure that it doesn't have any vertical movement because keep in mind, a lot of this stuff bears the load of the car on stuff like this. So any movement at all really of, of vertical play is gonna be a sign that you have a problem. Another thing to look for other than just play is gonna be dry rotted bushings. Visually, you'll see them cracked or cracking. They may be a sign that you have an issue coming. So 
you'll see dry rotted bushings and cracks and stuff like that wearing before there's actual play. So it is something to keep in mind and be aware of. If you look at the inside of these wheels on top of it being just hideous, someone was playing Tetris on top of here with wheel weights because what you do is when you're lazy and you're balancing wheels is if you can't balance it with the first weight, you just stick another one right on top of it. You just keep stacking them until you get it to, to balance. Now you can see here, this is a stainless line, which is a remnant of the brake upgrade on this car. So this car has stainless steel lines on the rear because the rear brakes are still here. So we have entered rear discs, which are better than the factory ones, which are solid. They are a larger diameter as well. So this car will stop a little bit better with the rear brakes. Okay, so here we are at the rear sway bar. This is the bracket that actually mounts it to the body. Here's the bushing. This is an 034 upgraded bar. And right here, there's a fitting that allows you to grease this joint to keep it from getting noisy. But I suspect it's been a hot minute since it's been greased. So that's where our noise is coming from. So I suspect if we, if we grease this, it should alleviate our rear suspension noise we have. That should alleviate our squeaking and squawking. Squawk. We're gonna talk about wheel bearings. So obviously you're probably not on a lift, but you, you lift it off the ground. You turn a wheel like this, wiggle it side to side like this, you'll be able to feel play. If you feel play, it's going to be likely related to the tie rod, which is what's attached to your steering of your car. There's an inner and an outer. You have to look at it to determine where the play is when you wiggle it. If there's no play like this, great, great news, nothing, no problem. This way, uh, this is how you would check to see if a wheel bearing was bad. If you have play this way, you push in and out like this, that means the wheel bearing, the part that actually holds the wheel to the car has play. And if that's wiggling, you need to fix it because it's gonna be both noisy and it could make your wheel fall off your car. So make sure you fix that. Aside from that, there is a ball joint on the bottom here that which you can pull in and out like this if it has play and there's no play there. So this is exceptionally reliable. Let's look at the interior. Okay, inside this car, for 130,000 miles, this car is actually in very nice shape inside. There's a little bit of wear on the driver's side seat. The bolsters have a little bit of wear showing, but not much at all. Steering wheel is in pretty good shape. The leather does show wear, but that's gonna be normal for any car that's been driven this many miles, but no really tears or rips or anything coming apart. Everything's super solid. I know that previously the e-brake was replaced. He mentioned that because the leather underneath here was actually peeling off. And so he replaced that. Now the start stop switch, you can see does have some pieces missing, but not enough to cut your finger off yet. Uh, but that will be coming soon to a finger near me. Use our push button start carefully. Ah! Ah! On the windshield here, you can see there are these mounts here and here that he has glued to the windshield. Uh, he previously had a wink mirror installed and has removed it because it was a obstruction of his view he, he said so in this case if you try to remove theirs there is a risk you could break the windshield and then uh then you have to buy a new one so <laughs> that'll be real exciting so i'll probably try to see there's a solvent that'll actually take that stuff off but if not i may just leave it on so you are probably wondering how did you buy this car for ninety two hundred dollars because it's actually pretty nice so yes this car is nice it does have a few things wrong with it most of those things actually add up to a lot more than you realize. If you start talking about properly painting a bumper, red is a color that's really hard for body shops to match because of tint and stuff like that. So they're gonna end up wanting to paint probably the whole fender, bumper, hood all together. Uh, the rear bumper, same deal, because otherwise none of this stuff on this car is gonna match. They do what's called blending. So that's going to be pretty significant in cost to paint this. Wheels obviously is a big thing. Car has a check engine light. So the downpipe is gonna have to be replaced or figure out a different solution to pass inspection. So especially where we are, we have to pass emissions and inspection to actually get this car drivable on the road. The list that you have on a car like this, there's obviously nothing majorly wrong with this car, but those few things that are seem small add up to a lot of money, especially if you're paying somebody else to do them. So this leads to, is this car a good deal? I say, yes, it's a good deal. Uh, for some of you at home, you probably are thinking, no, I would rather spend $3,000 more, that 12.5 number, and have a car like this from a dealer that that bumper is going to be already fixed. You're not going to have to worry about the check engine light. You're not going to have all these other faults in the system. That is a thing that you have to make the, the trade-off because oftentimes any car that's been A, previously modified or B, a private party seller, there's going to be no guarantees that you're going to be getting a turnkey car that's problem free. Some smaller used car dealers also might try to pass stuff off on you, but that is why I always recommend 
get your vehicle inspected regardless of whether it's private party or from a dealer. You can get a third party inspection to get you some peace of mind. People come to a shop like ours to actually get the car inspected. So that is very, very good advice. Anytime you're buying a car, get it inspected first before you buy pre-purchase, not post-purchase because you would not like to see a $6,000 estimate after you just bought a car. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.